I'm back with stuff that I do know how to do, talk about my, my research. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not going to talk about weak parties and strong partisanship per se, although this, this research is relevant to that. I'm going to talk about a different line of research on the political geography of, of presidential rhetoric and presidential populism that I'm working on with one of my MA students at, um, at Marquette. So before I get started on that, I did want to say thank you very much for having me here. It was fun to uh, take a little drive through real America between Milwaukee and Madison <laughs> on Badger Bus. Uh, I'm going to begin my, my presentation with a, with a song lyric. I'm not going to sing. You're welcome. Um, but the independent rock artist Amy Mann has a song called Unwell, which she, the lyrics are uh, from the perspective of Donald Trump about the campaign. And there's a lyric that says, though on the campaign trail, the papers paint me like a clown. Still all I see are crowds who want to fit me for a crown. And I thought that really captured some of the dynamic going into the 2016 election um, in which Trump was roundly rejected by elites, um, by newspaper endorsements, by the elites in his own party during the primary, and yet we kept seeing um, the attraction of his candidacy by uh, our two voters. I want to talk a little bit about how that populism relates to political geography in the American context. So first of all, looking at the immediate aftermath of the 2016 election, um, I've got a quote here, which you may or may not be able to, to read at this point, um, from an op-ed in the New York Times, it's quoting a Republican strategist talking about who the, candidate, who the right candidate will be for the Democrats in 2020. I'm not sure who that person is, but I am pretty sure that he or she does not reside in New York, Massachusetts, or California. Um, going a little bit more deeply into the, into the election results themselves, here I've got a quotation from our, our very own Kathy Kramer, uh, a piece that she published in Vox.com right after the election about here in Wisconsin. The way these folks described the world to me, their basic concern was that people like them in places like theirs were overlooked and disrespected. They were doing what they perceived good Americans ought to do to have the good life, but the good life was passing them by. Um, and then on the empirical side, I've got some election analysis from Nate Silver about the, uh, about the blue firewall, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, that was, of course, supposed to hold and carry Hillary Clinton to victory and, and didn't. So immediately, we start to see that the populism around Trump's candidacy was a populism of, of geography, of the, of the electoral college, but also of our perception of where elites live and where audiences who might be more receptive to a populist message live and the, the political significance of their votes. I want to put this in a little bit of historical context here with a couple of maps from, um, these are generated by the American Presidency Project on UCSB, talk about the history of American populism, which has been rooted in regional grievances. So these do not map on directly to the upper Midwest uh, question, the upper Midwest states, the Rust Belt states that were so important to Trump. Um, but there are these kind of two moments of populism. This could get us deeply into the discussion we had this morning about the definition of populism. Um, I'm going to talk about my very minimal definition of it for my data in a second. Um, but here we've got the kind of classic American populist party from the 1890s. That's an agrarian and economic populism on the left. Um, and so that's rooted very much in the concerns of a particular region and its economic base in, um, in, a, in rural economic life. And as you can see, so that's the populist party, James Weaver, third party candidate, these yellow states are his victories in, in 1892. Um, Fast forwarding to 1968, we have Southern populism, which is a very different animal, primarily a cultural populism. Um, and so here we've got George Wallace, American Independent Party, airing those kinds of grievances about ordinary Americans versus cultural and uh, coastal elites in the South. To put this in a little bit of a, in, in a Trump context, with Trump, I think we kind of see the narrative around him, and the narrative, of course, being told by coastal journalists and academics, um, kind of merges these two populisms in a little bit. There's some cultural grievances. There's some economic grievances. Um, I think the, the jury is still out on precisely what, um, what the motivations were for people voting for Trump in different parts of the country. Um, but one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about this in the 
in the context of 2016 and the broader arc of American history is that American electoral politics are so deeply regional. And that populism in particular has been so rooted in the way that people in particular regions define their interests and define how elites are disrespecting and not uh, taking those interests into account or taking them seriously. But American politics, whoops, I skipped. Um, where am I? Shoot. I went the wrong way. Okay, sorry. Um, so populism, or US politics is increasingly nationalized. Um, here I've got some of, the, some of the literature about this. There's increased consistency across presidential and congressional election results. So we no longer have people who vote for one party in a presidential race, but then adhere to their local representative or their, state, their senator for their state. Um, because that person represents them well, we no longer really see that. We see much higher correlation um, between presidential and, um, and congressional races. We see um, organizational nationalization of the parties starting around the end of the 19th century with the buildup of the national party organizations. Um, and so this all kind of had led me to ask the question, is there, is there a political geography to presidential appeals? Um, and I've looked at this for a couple of presidents. In the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about, about Trump. Um, when presidents travel on the road, what do they say? Do they reflect these historical, um, geographical, populist concerns, or do they say the same thing in every, in every context? I'm going to try to hit the right arrow this time. We'll see how that goes. Um, so here I'm going to talk a little bit about the data. Once again, drawing on the American presidency project, I've, Look at the public papers of the presidents. Right now what I'm trying to do is develop a data set that has the first 100 days of each of the recent presidents on the road. Um, this doesn't amount to a lot of speeches, but it gives us a nice comparable set. Um, and the way that I looked for populist appeals was to look for anti-elite language, language that talks about the whole people and language that talks about threats to, to, the, to the whole people. Um, I'll say a, a, a few things about the origins of this data set. So I started this project way before I had any inkling that Trump would be president or we would be having his populism conferences. Um, and I actually picked populism as my ideological variable. I have to be honest about this because Mike Wagner knows this story. Um, I picked populism as my ideological variable because it exists on the left and the right. And it would give me a kind of political style variable that I could use to look at Democrats and and Republicans, and what my real goal was, was just to look at when presidents travel, do they say the same things to different audiences? Do they tailor their remarks to different geographical audiences? Um, and so in, in the Trump data set, this would be super surprising, um, there's a real emphasis on grievance and elites. So here's just an overview, where did Trump go? I'll show you this in some, uh, some maps in a second. Um, so Trump likes to go to Florida. Um, <laughs> He went to some places in the near south, some places in the deep south. He actually did not spend a lot of time in the Rust Belt. He went to Pennsylvania a couple of times. Um, to give you an overview of how this compares with what other presidents do in their first 100 days, it's about the same number of speeches. And the pattern of going to a mix of swing states and states where you did quite well is also not especially unique. Obama did more or less the same thing. Um, but what did he say? Here's where things get um, where things get interesting, and here's where I'm experiencing a, a series of measurement questions. Um, so, how do we figure out how many populism references or how concentrated populism uh, populist appeals are in a particular geographical area? I have one version of this talk where I try to break this this down into regions. That's always fun. Um, having an argument with people about where Maryland fits in. Um, something you can do if you want to set your time on fire. Um, <laughs> people feel very strongly that Maryland is in the South, the North, the Mid-Atlantic, um, you name it. Um, that's where it is. So what we did here, my, my co-author and I, is we looked at the number of populism references. We tried to come up with a reasonable way to, to count them. Um, and then we have two denominators here. The one here at the top is per speech, um, and the one here at the bottom is per paragraph. Um, and so what we see here 
is I'm using state as map tile, which is a wonderful free tool to make a map of the United States, but it's also not terribly conducive to fractions. Um, so I need to speak to the, to the previous presenters about what kind of mapping software they use. Um, what we see here is that if you just look per speech, we do have a little bit of variation. The other thing that really became clear to me when I looked at this visually as, as compared to just looking at the list of states is how concentrated in the East um, Trump's speeches were overall. Um, what we see here is we see more, more per speech, um, particularly Pennsylvania, Maryland, um, and Kentucky. And we see a little bit of variation when we look at it per speech. When we break it down by paragraph, it becomes obvious that most of that variation, the source of it is the length of the speeches. Um, so in fact, there's, when it, so there's sort of a null result, right? When we ask, is there a political geography to Trump's populist appeals in his first 100 days? The answer is no. Um, um, unless you count the fact that he's only speaking in the eastern part of the United States, um, there's not a lot of variation when we, when we measure it that way. So what was he saying and who was he saying it to? Here's a little brief overview of some of these appeals. One of these is in Kentucky. Um, most importantly, we're going to take back the power from the political class in Washington and return that power to you, the American people. That's at one of his uh, favorite places to use populist references, which is a Make America Great Again rally. Um, we've also got, in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, a populist reference about NAFTA, Popu that politicians were, were too preoccupied, they should have re renegotiated this, and I'm not going to allow the put-upon taxpayers to... Uh, to suffer anymore. And that was the re remarks of the Congress of Tomorrow retreat. So there he's speaking to other Republican elites. Um, and then finally, our big, uh, our big moment for populism for Trump last year in 2017 is in, in Maryland at uh, the Conservative Political Action Conference, CPAC. Happened, um, it just closed up about a week ago. It happened in uh, late February, also last year. And this is where we got a number of these kinds of, of remarks that all I want you to know is we're fighting the fake news, it's fake, it's phony, I call the fake news the enemy of the people. And so we had a lot of anti-media references in that CPAC speech. This is not going to be terribly, um, terribly surprising, but I think that the implications of this tell us something a little bit about how populist appeals are being used, at least in this um, in this contemporary context, which is not only that they're not particularly being trotted out in front of audiences in Michigan or Wisconsin or places in the Rust Belt that Trump won unexpectedly, but they're primarily being used, they're primarily being aimed at other conservative elites um, and other people who have assembled for the purpose not of, not of having their interests appealed to as someone who's left out of the political process to speak to uh, what Sherry was saying earlier, but as people who are, who are already excited by something going on in conservative politics. I want to speak a little bit about the, um, about the, the broader implications of this. So I think it does speak to a nationalization of party politics. Um, I think it does suggest that as we're thinking about directions to go, that we need to think deeply about the linkages between populism and conservatism, and particularly conservatism as it's um, as it's expressed in an elite context. Um, and to put this in also in some comparative context, last time I tried to give this talk with the Bush slides, I went way too long um, and didn't get to finish. But I'll just tell you, this is not the George W. Bush picture. He did not use a lot of populist rhetoric. Some of that is because I think the, the nonverbal and visual rhetoric and the overall sense of his appeals implied some populism, and I have no idea how to code for that. Um, but it's, it's quite, but he did not talk about the media as being the, the enemy of the people, for example. The sort of anti-elite piece of presidential rhetoric is quite, is quite new. Presidents talk about, you know, they'll talk about the people, they'll talk about the election, um, but specifically naming a domestic antagonist is not a typical piece of, of modern presidential rhetoric. So that's, that's what I have so far, um, and I look forward to questions. I will attempt to be a ringmaster uh, for questions. Looks like Devon. Uh, just a general question uh, uh, for the panel, but then one specifically for uh, uh, Julia. 
Um, you know, this question of you know, how do we define populism, what are its kind of contours and features, uh, I think is a really important one, and it kind of picks up where uh, uh, Lance's talk left off. So I'd love for each of you to kind of give your take and engaging his talk. Is populism the right term? Do we need something else? You know, is it a symptom or is it a phenomenon uh, uh, itself? And then for Julia particularly, I'm wondering, you know, are you, I'm sure you're aware of Eric Oliver and, and Wendy Ron's work on Trump, Trump folk and the, their analysis of his, the populism in his speeches in, during the election and kind of comparing for the candidates. Um, they were also seeing a lot of evidence of more simplicity in his language to appeal to uh, uh, regular people and the collectivism, like we're in this together. Are you, are you looking for that in the speeches as well? I, I, you mentioned that kind of anti-elitism, which is also a third big theme. I'm just wondering if that's your orientation. Are you sharing that with them, or are you taking a different approach to looking at the speeches? So that's a good question. We're kind of at the beginning of, of, these, um, of these speeches. I don't think, because we're doing our coding, we're doing kind of qualitative hand coding, so I don't know if simplicity is going to be something we're going to be able to look for. Um, the collective, I hadn't thought about that. I'm not sure. Um, so right now we're mainly focused on the anti-elite and I see populism as primarily about antagonism, uh, which kind of gets to my answer to the other question. Yeah. I can to all of you yeah. about the question. Of um, I think it depends a bit on the problem you are investigating. I mean, if you go to my problem, like the electoral success of certain politicians, then I think Populism is just a good tool because um, you can see what unites them. And, and that is the reason why I focus on populist ideology because that is what, what you said. It's the same on the left and on the right. So it unites them. And on the other hand, it's the most socially relevant part um, because ideology is, is most influential on the people, more than form or style or or strategy, that, that is what influences the people, and that is what, what creates in-groups and out-groups. Um, that is transfer, uh, transferred by, uh, by ideology. So I think there are different approaches, but I, I think if we have certain criteria to evaluate them, I would say that, that the one um, that populism is an ideology is a thin ideology, and that is favored by a lot of political scientists at the moment anyway, I think it's the most promising. Yeah, I mean, I said this um, <coughs> last night. I spent the first part of my career studying the interwar period. And historians have probably written, oh, dozens of books on what is fascism. This kind of definitional debate gets really bad really quickly. So I mean, look, there's obviously a huge variation. And we should not discount that. And we shouldn't skirt around it. But at some point, we have to move past it or we're never going to do anything. I mean, there clearly are some common qualities, right? So they were all mentioned. Populists claim to speak for the people, right? Which implies a sort of maniac and Manichaean version of society, antagonism, there are enemies, blah, blah, blah. The other component of that linked to it, right, is an anti-establishment bias and going with that, right, a willingness to work around established political institutions. I do not think populist parties are anti-democratic. I think then we're shifting into an entirely different political category. They may be anti-liberal, but they are not anti-democratic, so I disagree strongly with Lance on that. Otherwise, we're conflating populism with fascism and communism, and then we really are sort of moving off into you know sort of a definitional nowhere, right? But these are parties, movements that claim to speak for the people, right, which has all kinds of implications beyond that, and that are anti-establishment, meaning not just there's an establishment out there we're against, but we are willing to work outside of and against establishment institutions, the media, traditional political parties, yada, yada, yada. Beyond that, I don't think we really need all that much. We can move on. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Well, since we can now, <laughs> sorry, excuse me. I, I just want to say that since we are now allowed to criticize uh, Lance, uh, <laughs> I, I just want to go back to my point where I, where, where he, he was, he was saying about the right ideology, right, like right extreme. But what does it mean? I mean, if you look on the two parties that I love the most, from National and Law and Justice, uh, both in France and in, in, in Poland. Uh, they are very strongly cultural on the right, 
they are very strongly cultural and uh, Christian oriented party, Jewish, but in the sense of, of economy, they are give them all party, right? So I mean it's I think we, we need some more subtle. That's why we try to use this idea of the cultural and economic uh, measurement of the of the of the populism because populism sure if we use the very thin definition of that, but then where would we go next? Who can be really the, the populist party? Maybe all the parties are populist if we make it th that way. Yeah, I mean that's so. I guess uh, responding to the question about what we think are. What we think is useful about the definition of populism to me is that it gives us this democratic veneer, and that it, but that it also makes <coughs> democratic discourse antagonistic. So that's the, I think that's, for me, that's sort of the key thing, and that's the thing that my analysis is focused on. But I also think that's why it's useful to, to separate out populism from what I think is really some, you know, more, some of the key ideas in the United States, like nationalism and, and racism, which we haven't talked about as much as. Um, as, as we maybe could have. Uh, but I think that populism is a separate piece and it's part of how elites sell that. And that's really what draws me to, to continue doing this project. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, this is for Sherry Berman in particular. I'm very struck by your argument that you know, the loss of voice of publics in the United States and Europe is a very real phenomenon and helps explain the rise of populism. But I wonder what you make of an argument that Ian Shapiro has made. The more reforms that have increased, have attempted to increase participation of ordinary publics in the party system and in, in, in politics generally, the more the alienation from the elites and, and, and the political system that has become. So the McGovern reforms in the United States, the political parties, the increasing use of referenda and primaries in Europe and so forth. So look, there's, there's a huge debate sort of um, related to the one I think that a lot of people are grappling with here about this concept of illiberal democracy, right? Which is the idea that, um, you know, the real problem is that democracy, democracies have become too democratic. And in fact, we should start insulating policy making, political decisions, yada, yada, yada from the people because they're a bunch of morons and we can't trust them and they do stupid things. Um, essentially what Shapiro says. I no, I, no, 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 no. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying him, but I, there's, there, is this, there is this literature out there, and it's come back with a vengeance ever since Trump is elected. All of these books kind of criticizing democracy, in, both in the United States and in, um, and in Europe. I think this is fundamentally misguided, not only because I think it misreads what actually has been going on. So there certainly have been reforms that have done things like opened up political parties, the primaries in the United States. But if you look at the trends overall, um, amounts and opportunities for participation, responsiveness measured in a variety of ways. And again, responsiveness is a term we could debate how to, how to um, operationalize over and over again. But the overwhelming empirical evidence is that institutions have become less responsive, less democratic over time. That's not a homogenous trend, but it is certainly, I think, a fairly empirically strong one across the West. So to argue that we should respond to the diminishing responsiveness um, and democracy of institutions by insulating them even more strikes me as not only misreading what's been going on, but suggesting um, a policy response that is only likely to infuriate people who feel they have no voice correctly even more. So I mean, look, I think there's a big debate going on about what democracy means about how to make it responsive, but yet responsible. And I think we haven't fully puzzled that out. But I think part of that is because a lot of people haven't really, elites in particular, have not really wanted to fully recognize not just how strong the perception of lack of responsiveness is, of lack of voice, but the reality is as well. And so I think we really need to kind of, again, get a better empirical sense of what's going on, not only in people's minds, but actually with our institutions. And then we can debate, OK, so what's the best way to fix this problem? But the idea that um, you know, democracy has become too democratic, that our institutions are too open and participatory, strikes me as the kind of elitist fantasy that could only be done by people I live in Brooklyn, who live in Brooklyn <laughs> and never travel outside of it. So I say that, you know, being part of this, proudly part of this tribe, someone made a nasty comment about Brooklyn before. I'm just going to let that slide. Then there are those who live in Madison. Yeah. <laughs> Can situation. I jump in on this, too? Because this actually does speak to the, the weak parties and strong parties and shipping. And I think that the excessive democracy argument, as it's made, kind of only works if, 
if what if you're arguing about well the people are are stupid, it only works if people are voting for policies that are stupid that are then getting enacted. And that's not how American how the American system works at all, right? The American system has all these veto points, so very little is getting done. Um, and it seems to me that the problem, the responsiveness problem, is not so much on the participation side, but it's on the on the supply side, where, where there's lack of power structures in Congress. Right now, we've seen this with the whatever Congress we're in now, the 115th, where leaders in Congress can't get their caucuses to do things, and that's why you've seen relatively little of this agenda enacted. And that might everyone might not agree that that's a bad thing, but that is the responsive politics model that's that's falling apart. Is you don't have you don't have elite power structures where elites can get each other to do stuff in response to what the people demanded. Deb, yeah, hand up. Sorry. It was actually just a, on the definition question and again, um, Sherry. So you're saying that populism. I mean, there's kind of a set of family resemblances between the different ways it's being used, and there's, I think you said, two core elements. And the first, you just, just say it one. More. Okay, so again, as before, I think if we define it on the version of policies, we're, we're gone, right? So I think there's two sort of common things that distinguish populist parties, um, putting them both in a category of their own and being able to then separate them from others. One is they claim to speak in the name of the people, right? This, yeah, this is not my particular distinguishing so characteristics, yeah? Just, I'm just trying to understand, um, I, was, I was thinking back to Obama, yes we can, we all of us speaking on behalf, or Macron in France who had a listening army of 6,000 and they went on a listening tour and the voices of the people were in a database and drawn upon in his campaign. Are those both not examples of... So it, the, the, yeah. the, 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 we, the, the people there in the sort of terms like I had, you know, sort of Marine Le Pen and Donald Trump there, this is, uh, again, a sort of uh, different terms you use, um, Manichaean, antagonistic. It's not we the people, you can all be part of this movement, right? I want to speak for the country. It's there's a people who exist separate from, okay, so on the left, often the antagonism is to economic elites, right? Or international business. Um, when the tinge is a little bit to the right, oftentimes the antagonism is towards whatever, coastal elites, immigrants, minorities. So it has to be a conception of the people in the sense that these are the people who have been ignored, um, uh, looked down upon, have not been given their just share. It's not, I speak for, you know, Hillary Clinton had the, what was the, the sign, that did, the thing that she had, to, we together or something like that. And all politicians want to appeal to people. It has to be a conception of the people, again, that includes this kind of antagonistic Manichaean vision. So okay, and, and maybe maybe to add up, I think the point is that you are not born as a populist. I mean, I think it's a it's a gradual phenomenon. It's not not a binary thing. It's not either populist or non-populist. So so you can be a bit populist in some speeches. You can be populist in some statements. You can in others. You're not. And so so I would say that almost all politicians once in their life are populist or make populist statement. And I think it's just a matter of degree. Um, and I think you can even show that in the empirical data that, that, that there are mainstream parties or political actors that become increasingly populist um, because of this. You know? It's just a matter of your threshold, where you put it. You know? But that would be an artificial decision, you know? like saying, OK, now that is a populist, and now it's not anymore. I, I, I don't think that that works. The uh, CV? Um, I'll stand up because I can't see any of you. So I guess this would be, I really guess a question for anyone slash everyone since that seems to be how these are going, but within the definition of a populist, I can understand the kind of, there's a populist ideology and we can see how that gets mapped on to people in, in different public spheres, but when it comes to leadership, right, we have a word for people who appear to be populist and are not, which is a demagogue. And I'm wondering why the difference making is, like why we're not drawing out those differences between people who say that they are and then do pass policies or do in the motivations behind their rhetoric otherwise demonstrate that they are not speaking for the people, even if they do say they are, and sort of why, are, why shy away from or otherwise not engage in language that does hint at that deception or says it very plainly. I can, I 
can start with an attempt. There's a lot, a lot there, and I'm probably not adequate to the task, but I'm going to try. Um, I think in the U.S. case, the problem is this table's on wheels, by the way. Um, <laughs> I think that the problem is um, is the divergence between talking about talking about cultural populism and talking about economic populism. Those are basically not integratable, I think, anymore. That's, I think, the the result of what I'm seeing or my read on contemporary. Um, political history is that is that there's there's cultural populism, the idea of speaking for the people that has taken on a national and racial dimension and a kind of anti-coastal elite dimension, and then there's economic populism that's almost completely been owned by the by the Democratic Party, and we're actually not seeing Republican elites talk about it very much. Um, that's I, that's my guess is these two things can't be integrated, but I don't that doesn't fully answer your question, but that's my read. I think, I think what, what an advantage is, um, in contrast to demagogy, is that the populism can be, um, you can have that at the, in the population and in political leadership. You know, populist attitudes, we see that in, in research, there are like empirical populist attitudes and you can measure them. And they even form clusters and dimensions and relate to each other. So they, they are actually an empirical const construct there. You know, and on the same, and you can measure the same in political speeches, and I think that is the big advantage that that, that concept has, and that's that's the kind of the update towards other um, um, older models. But in the end, populism is an old concept. I mean, you can trace that back to to ancient Greece. Um, there were populists there. If you call them demagogues <coughs> or populists, I mean, it doesn't matter. But I, I think this empirical component. I mean, there are two research teams at the moment that are really concerned with that, and they have really like promising results. I mean, you can actually see that. That's an empirical concept, and you can validate that, and you can say, okay, um, this relates to authoritarianism, and this, this relates to other things. And I think that is, that is an improvement, in my, in my view, at least. Well, just to add to that, what I think at least what we are, I think what we are missing a little bit is this division between how pop populistic are the leaders and how populistic are the parties themselves. So this is something that I think it would be very interesting to really like compare on the larger because w what we tried to do, I mean, I was doing the research on the party and the results are a little bit different than what you did in your, in your, in your research on the, on, the, uh, on the leaders themselves. So th I think it would be very interesting to put all the theoretical assumption that we are having on what populism is and then put it into our research on populism in communication and what is the difference between the parties which for me I would say that they are not trying that much to to use this populistic th the discursive methods as the leaders are right so if you ask me for France the the Front National in its in its all, it's much less populistic than Marine Le Pen is in her speeches. So I, I guess there is like a point where we can go in the, in the research. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to get if it was unclear. The labeling figureheads as populist versus populism as you're speaking of it, you know, kind of as a, as a movement and a construct that we can kind of, as a set of traits that we can ascribe to it. Uh, Silvio and then uh, Hernando. Yeah, I think so what we're dealing with now is the, the problem of you know, going too far and, uh, and defining populism by the world. You know, if you talk about the populism at home, then it is a populism. <laughs> and we know that on the one hand, you know, that is limited because populists do things when they are in office that actually don't fit this discourse about the people, the voices of the people, and stuff. And we have you know, sort of studies around this, but at the same time we know that certain populist words do make the difference in terms of identification and sort of issues that were mentioned in the previous panel. So I will not go that far into sort of equating populism with certain kind of rhetoric, because then it gets really slippery. Nor I will say that it has no consequences. So that's why to me it's more about sort of the conception of politics rather than a question of political discourse. Because if you go into political discourse, you go into some kind of uh, debate that actually loses sight of the broader sort of dimensions of populism, not just the question of economic populism, which is the way that economists think about populism completely different from much of what we were saying here. But it gets into right wing and left wing populism and all kinds of stuff. At least the discussion around populism in, in Latin America that I that I know better started 
34 years ago, primarily around the question of rhetoric, ended up in a very different place. Otherwise, you know, it reminds me of what people used to say about uh, Muhammad Ali. Now, people talk about what he's saying rather than focusing on what he's doing. And what he's doing is really what is happening, not what he's talking about. So to me, it's sort of analogous to let's beware of when we go with this direction of identifying populism primarily with a matter of rhetoric without underestimating its relevance and take sort of a broader conception of what actually it means. Otherwise, as Sherry Pompeo said, it gets blurry with all kinds of other categories and then we sort of are in the conceptual nowhere. Yeah, but may I, may I have something? Yeah. I, I think you're right, and I think behavior is definitely important, but I think that also, um, also the, the, the content, the media content is important because it has detrimental effects. I mean, it does things, you know, it influences people. And, and there are lots of studies that show that it, incre it increases polarization in society. So it, it is important, it's relevant. And of course, behavior is also important. And it, it is important to see what, what populists do when they are in office. Sometimes they, they try to, to keep their populist ideology and act in a populist way, and sometimes they just abandon all the, the ideology. And, and uh, I think that's important. But, but what they say and, and the discourse is important, especially in the context of our conference when we deal with, with media content and, and the influence of, of, of social media on, on, on society, um, because it's, it's really hard to, to, to trace the impact of political behavior on the society in an empirical way. Um, I mean, I, I didn't want to suggest um, that my conception of populism was one purely, that was purely rhetorical. I think that this kind of um, appeal or this kind of self-definition has very powerful effects, not only because the discourse matters, which it surely does, but because by latching yourself onto that part of the population that feels, you know, sort of shat upon or not um, spoken to, the policies lead from it. So in Europe, for instance, speaking for that group of the voiceless, right, generally means some combination of kind of welfare state nativism and anti-immigrant sentiment. In the United States, right, the people who feel they have no voice don't really want the government, right? They're not, although it might be in their economic self-interest to actually have more government policies, their perceived desire is the government sucks, Right? It helps other people, I get nothing, and so you get a combination in the United States of these voiceless people getting an appeal based on some kind of, you know, sort of cultural conservatism, vague xenophobia, sometimes not so vague, and a kind of anti-government kind of set of policies, right? Now, the policies in Latin America will differ, right? Because the people who feel like the political system hasn't been responsive to them are a somewhat different subgroup, and they have somewhat different perceived interests. So, I mean, the advantage of not going directly to the policies is A, a I think you manage to make better cross-national comparisons, and B, what's going to appeal to the voiceless in different countries depends on the particular national context, I think. And that's, that's really important. That's why I think trying to map this onto left-right or sort of right wing on the cultural, right wing on the economic is the wrong way to go, right? Because that's going to vary actually from country to country depending on particular conditions, particular histories, yada, yada, yada. I want to just jump in on the American political party's side because one of the things we've, we've continued to return to here is how we classify parties in a multi-party system as populist. And in the United States, that's not so much our consideration. We have a two-party system. Um, and so much of that kind of competition happens within parties. And that's what we can really observe by looking at Trump's discourse. We get our, our kind of first look at the way in which Trump may be transforming the Republican Party. And we've seen quite a bit of evidence that that's, that that's occurred. Um, so I think it's, it's not the whole picture, but it does give us some measurable data to look at how at, the, at Trump as, as a party leader, as president, um, and then what kinds of lasting results and transformation we might see from there. So I know um, I just wanted I started to do uh, housekeeping in front of uh, the company, but um, so Pippa's talk is at four forty-five. Right. We, we should probably wrap up. Cup okay, so then we'll take a quick, you know, restroom break and what have you, and set up for Pippa. So a couple we'll have time for a few more questions, but Hernando is next. So I, I want to go back to this sort of 
binary distinction between uh, speaking for the people or not speaking for the people, because I think that that doesn't get us very far, because every politician is speaking for the people, it's just that what people are we talking about, right? Is it my in-group? That's the people. Is it cross group solidarities? And then is it we as a people? Or is it even a global solidarity in which you're kind of speaking then for the whole planet, right? And so, so I think, I think all politicians speak for the people, but what people they're speaking for varies significantly. And, and, yeah. and probably that would be a more fruitful think, way of thinking of it. Yeah, I think one important part of the definition of populist ideology is that the people or the in group is a monolithic conception. And it's anti-pluralist. And I think that is, that is an important part. Maybe we missed that here in that discussion. And, and, and that makes the difference between um, like the, the normal, ordinary politician, the democratic politician, and the populist. And I think that is also the dangerous thing, because then we really turn into a liberal democracy where we, where we oppose a plural society and pluralistic um, democracy. And I think, I think that, is, that is the difference. Maybe yeah, I mean, we can I, find a common ground there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's what I was trying to get at, perhaps not so successfully, also in answering Deb's question, right? Which is, obviously, all politicians, on some level, sort of claim to want to capture as many votes and speak for their people. The distinctive thing about populists, right, is this sort of antagonistic, anti-pluralist, you know, sort of division of the world, right? So when Macron, for instance, gathers, he doesn't particularly exclude anyone. Anyone could vote for him. He doesn't claim to be representing one group as opposed to another. Similar with Obama, right? So they had, they wanted to be popular, but I would not characterize their appeals or their nature as populist because they didn't have this view of the world where there were a bunch of, again, a distinct group of people who they wanted to represent as opposed to these, whatever, these outgroups. This is super helpful, and it, I, I'm just thinking, it's such a bad name for the concept, because the concept is getting clearer, but populist makes me think, anyways, something that's popular that appeals to all. should be more like fragmentist. <laughs> you, know, sort of like, you know, that you embrace fragmentism, and you pick your fa favorite fragment, and you do it, you know, at the peril of the rest. And that, so that, that approach of then voicing the fragment, the unvoiced fragment, is what I'm hearing. Yeah. It's a clear concept, and it's just got a lousy name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> true, uh, definitely. Because and you have that late conception of populism all the time, and that, that mixes up with, with our academic understanding. And, and of course, that is a, a big problem. It was late, but it's also effective because we're all human beings here, too. Yes. So it's actually, sure. I, think it's I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna suck up too much time, but I mean, I think the, the rationale, or a rationale for the populist label is the sort of second part, right, which is that it's also an anti-establishment kind of movement, right? And so the populist sort of rubric gets to that sort of second, admittedly, um, you know, related part, right, which is we are not of the establishment and we are not interested in playing necessarily by their rules or within their institutions. So I think that's the sort of dichotomization that, pop that that label captures more, right? It's not the popular people one so well, but perhaps a little bit better, this idea that we're opposed to establishment rules, establishment norms, even establishment institutions. And so, you know, we're going to go outside of those things, not necessarily outside of democracy in some simplistic sense, but outside of the kind of traditional rules of the game. Um, but, you know, labels are labels. This is, uh, I wasn't just saying that I wanted to just ask it, push this a little further. I mean, historically, populism does say attempt to represent the entire people of the nation, right, of a specific nation against a small group of elites who are either cosmopolitan elites manipulating the nation or national elites who are acting in an anti-popular way on the one hand, and of course all those who are not part of the nation who are defined as, you know, all non Germans, all non-white people, all non all people who are excluded outside of outside of that boundary. And I think almost we're losing we're losing that dimension of populism, which which although it can be slippery, it can be more slippery in, in in the contemporary context when it takes on so many definitions. I think that implicit nationalism is not simply a characteristic; it's actually the it's actually the assertion of the peoplehood of the nation, which I still think lies beneath certainly American Trump Trumpist populism 
and I suspect, although not known it as well, much of the European populism too. Right, but that, I mean, that gets back to what we've been talking about, right, which is an, it's an attempt to define who the people are, right? Who is the we? Who is the nation? Who is a legitimate member right. of, that, of that collectivity, right? And, I mean, that's it's, part it's of every, the endeavor. It's everyone like us. Yes. Right. But the, every, the point is, I mean, if you look at the exclusion of the others right. in, in, my, in my diagram, right. then you can see that there is a lot of variance who the others are. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah? Um, if you look at uh, Duterte in the Philippines, it's the criminals, you know? And then you have religious outgroups, and yeah, it depends, the non-Christians, whatever. And, and, and some people, they even call it the, the double vertical structure. You have like, like the elites on top, and then you have like the people, and then you have the others underneath, you know? And they are some kind inferior of the people, you know? And, and I think that is, that is really, that, that comes very close to the, to the concept. Um, sorry, I'm making faces up here. So I'm, I'm trying to think of all the different things I've read in American and comparative politics that try to distinguish populism from, from nationalism, which we haven't conceptualized all that well, maybe in the US case to begin with. Um, but it seems to me that the, we're, we're getting, I think, a little bit down the rabbit hole of thinking about who the people are. And surely that's an important component of the definition, but it's not the whole definition. And some of it is this antagonism, which I've, I've talked a little bit, a lot about, which is really what I see manifesting in Trump's rhetoric. I think part of that is those are things you can say in public. Um, you, can, you can hate on the media, for example. Um, but, and we still seem to have some constraints in that regard. Um, but the other thing about it is that it's, it's actually a dynamic ideology, right, about how to solve problems, not just about who the people are. And that's where I think populism, both on the left and the right, is we solve the problem when we take down the elite. And then it gets real fuzzy as to what this taking down is going to be like and what we do with the losers of that contestation. But it shifts to, go on, to, to Sherry's point and the point many other people have raised about whether this is intrinsically illiberal, the question is, does that move you out of the normal realm of pluralistic contestation and into this, this contest in which the losers are delegitimized and, and shunned from the respectable polity? And that's like, it very rarely happens, but I think it's the story of, of how, what that's supposed to look like. And you see it on the left too, right? That's, I mean, here we are in Wisconsin, right? I don't ever do an open forum without someone saying, we just need to take money out of politics. Um, and maybe that, that, maybe that is true, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean people who have money who are spending it on politics are the whole problem, right? There, there's got to be some other theory about how power works, and what populism is is an incredibly thin theory about how power works and how we can solve problems. Uh, Chris had his hand up. Yeah, so I'd love to pick up the, the sort of Sherry Lance debate over the anti-democraticness of the um, of some of the movements that we're seeing. Um, and, and sort of to, to push Sherry a little bit, and also Julia, since you've, you've written on, on norms in the dem democratic sphere, um, two points. One is that whether or not the movements themselves are anti-democratic, we certainly are seeing an, an anti-democratic movement in the sense of the, the full and monk evidence that people are literally saying dem democracy isn't that important. And it's circumstantial. We don't, I haven't seen exactly the evidence about supporters of those specific parties, whether they're the ones that are saying that. That's one thing. But the second one is, is the evidence around Trump and his certainly uncivil behavior and also his violation of norms. Um, and a lot of those are, are democratic norms, uh, most egregiously you know, not committing to accept the results of a democratic election. That seems anti-democratic to me. And I'm wondering, I guess, Sherry, if you would clarify sort of if you see these, these uh, parties or movements having another vision of democracy, what, how, how does that work and, and how, does it, how, does it man how could it manifest if it doesn't include a, a civil sphere of some kind of discussion? Is it just mob democracy, or what do you have in mind? So, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, and as you well know, there's been a lot of discussion in the literature about this. I mean, there's, there's an important distinction to be made between parties that have explicitly anti-democratic appeals. Again, as I mentioned previously, you know, I spent the first part of my life studying the interwar period. You know, if you go back to truly fascist movements, they were not like, yeah, you know, um, we just want to have better elections and, you know, more responsive elites. They were like, democracy, no, it sucks, right? So, I mean, I think there's an important distinction just on that level. You're right in that there is an important relationship that we've had in the West 
um, since the second, um, it, since the post during the post-war period, between liberalism and democracy, we've assumed that those things go together because they have. But historically, a they have not, and b what we may very well be seeing now is a kind of separation of those things, right? So, I mean, the classic populist style, and this gets back to this this woman's question about you know sort of demagogues is. You know, I have a direct relationship with the people, right? The rest of these institutions in this establishment, they are corrupt, they're not responsive, so I'm gonna bypass them, right? And so I am the true Democrat. And from a strict sort of Schumpeterian definition, minimalist definition of democracy, that's actually okay, right? Relatively free and fair elections, and the rest of the stuff is just icing on the cake. Now, we in the West have not defined democracy that way for, you know, again, since the end of the Second World War. We think of this as liberal, with all kinds of restraints on executive power, all kinds of protections for minorities, an assumption that certain kinds of norms and certain kinds of li civil liberties are sort of untouchable. But what we may be seeing now is a return to a pattern that existed in the past, right? Which where liberalism and democracy are separated and people are just like, democracy, okay, liberalism, pluralism, I'm not so sure of. Um, so, I'm, but, but that this could be degenerative, I absolutely see. But I think both its appeal and its ostensible goals, Marine Le Pen does not say, I really want to get rid of democratic, you know, elections and other, you know, sort of manifestations of democracy. That it could degenerate over time, absolutely, anything can. But that's certainly not, again, either what, it's, either what these movements or politicians say they're going to do, nor do I think it's really what their appeal is to the people who vote for them. I think it's just the opposite. They feel, again, that they want more responsive institutions and politicians. Okay, Devon, for the last question. But this is maybe more of a comment, and I'd, I'd love to talk to people afterwards about that, but, but this goes back to CB's comment. We, we, have, we keep talking about the rhetoric of populists, or, and this is kind of Sylvia's point too, but do we look at the outcomes of what they achieve, meaning, do people who run on populist platforms, and I think of it less in terms of parties in the US than I think about individual candidates, do they then deliver on the populist agenda, or is that just a tactic to get into office? So I look at Trump, oh, populist, 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 he gets in and he passes the biggest corporate tax cut we've seen, and corporate buyback of stock as a result. That's so anti-populist, it's not even funny, right? And so I'm trying to understand the gap between the rhetoric and the action, and I'm wondering, is anyone studying Right, because that seems to me to be essential to this question. I mean, it depends. I mean, if you look in Europe, for example, if you have like Viktor Orban in Hungary, and, and he came into office, and what he did is like he really, um, he, he followed his plan of liberal democracy, and he, he actually combated um, the media, and, and he, he actually delivered in a certain way, you know? Um, and, and some, some uh, presidents in, in Latin America it as well in a certain way. I mean, you have to ask Silvio, he's, he's more of an expert in, in that regard. And, but there are other, other populists that, that don't, you know? Um, so it depends. Uh, but there is research on that. So is that person a fake populist thing? Yeah. A real populist? Yeah. Well, you don't know. I mean, <laughs> probably something like a fake, a fake populist or pretended. Is, is there a penalty for being a fake populist? You get voted out because you didn't deliver? Yeah. And I'm just curious I mean, the term it seems so fraught, and it seems so like unhelpful in some regards when we don't actually look at those kinds of outcomes. Well, I mean, Trump has only been in office for, you know, part of his term. I mean, I, I think that that's, you know, and he's the first person we've identified as a populist leader in the United States. I mean, there has been some track record in Europe. I mean, on the issue, as many people have pointed out, that was their signature issue in Europe, there has been a gargantuan shift in immigration um, policies, in um, understandings of what um, is appropriate levels of immigration. So yeah, they've kind of delivered on that, which is their signature issue in many ways. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was a populist, right? Wouldn't we all call Teddy Roosevelt a populist? No. No. Right? I don't know. <laughs> no? I don't know. You didn't say Well, just to, uh, just that, I mean, in Poland, they do deliver. I mean, they very strongly deliver, and their popularity is growing. OK, so they, they started with a high coming into the parliament, but now the popularities, even though they, they, they hate democratic institutions, if you wish, if they go against all the media, if they go, go against the legal elites, people do like it and they do deliver what people want. Even if, in, I think in 10 years time, we can have this conversation and think, 
what was the real outcome of their delivery? I hope in 10 years you can come back to our conference, did the populace deliver? But now <laughs> we have to break for a few minutes before uh, Pippa Norris's final keynote. Thank you very much to this panel and for your great questions. Short break. Short break. <laughs>